who am I is a, always a very interesting question because the name that you are given when you are born is not necessarily the name of who you are, i.e. your spiritual self. And a lot of people change their name during their lifetime because it doesn't resonate with them and they go to something that works a bit better. Um, so who you are really becomes a question of more who you are from a spiritual sense. And I went through a lot of my life questioning who I was and got to a point where I realized I didn't have to have a name per se, it was more what I did spiritually that was important. And I, I was uh, connected to Source and Source explained to me that, that in the galaxies and in the universe, there are a number of spiritual beings that are referred to by him and the best way he could describe it was as keepers of light. Now keepers of light are like roving librarians with um, microphones and video cameras is they go around and they record all the vibrational energies of a civilization and existence and the way they do that is by incorporating into that existence. So they would incarnate into a human form and experience all the things that go on in a human form and thereby recording it all in their DNA, which is a cosmic DNA. And they would spend hundreds, thousands of lives on a particular planet um, recording everything. In particular, like on Earth, I've had over 4,000 lives here. Can I remember them all? No, I can't. But I get flashes every now and then when it becomes rele uh, relevant. And, and then that's just on this planet and there's been other lives on other planets as well. So you get this like a massive library and the library exists in um, not just visual images, um, not just uh, sound recordings, but also in emotions and every form of possible experience is recorded. And it was explained to me that that's who I was and that was my function here. And when I got that explanation, it made my whole life make sense about why I hadn't fitted in with the mainstream population and why I had things in my head that were totally in conflict with what the so-called experts uh, were saying, particularly like with things like Egypt. Every time I read a book on Egyptology, I'd go, that's wrong, that the timings are wrong. And so then it came down to, well, um, understanding that, that, that who you are is more important than what your name is. And, you know, if we talk about God, well, God is a name that people on this planet have given that consciousness. God itself has no name and has no need for a name. So whenever people argue about whether it's God or whether it's Krishna or whether it's Allah or whether it's Jehovah or whatever, God's laughing because he said, I'm none of those and I'm all of them. You can call me whatever you want. It doesn't change what I am. You know, if I take, if I take a book and I hold it up and I say, this is a book and everyone goes, yeah, yeah. And then I pull that up and I say, no, this is a cat. Whatever you call it doesn't change what it is. Okay. We're the only beings that seem to be so preoccupied with, you know, what our name is. And, that, and that's to do with our ego. We have an ego for a purpose, and that's part of the process of why we're here. The process of being here is to experience, end of story, just to experience, is our higher consciousness. And, and if we understand there is only oneness, there is only the collective consciousness, there is only the source, there is only the, the singularity, the void, whatever you want to call it, it is, it is a point an infinite point of nothingness, an infinite point of consciousness. So it's all things and no things at the same time. And for it to truly know what it was, it needs a mirror. You know, you don't know what you look like until you look in a mirror. And once you've looked in a mirror, you go, oh, that's what I look like. Okay. Until that time, you have no understanding of what you look like. You don't know what you sound like until you record yourself and play yourself back. And anybody who's done that will tell you, oh, it doesn't sound anything like me. And everyone says, no, that's what you sound like. So our mirrors are not always complete. For instance, what we see in a mirror is a mirror image, not a photograph. And if you actually hold up a photograph of yourself while you look in the mirror, the two images are totally different. So what we see 
is often a reflection of everything that we're not rather than everything that we are. So we need some sort of feedback system, some sort of mechanism by which we can know ourselves. And this is what Source decided to do. It said, I need a mechanism by which I can truly know myself. So it created the absence of itself. And in doing that, created a process of fragmentation. And we are just a very small fragment of that consciousness. Like if I take a drop of water out of the ocean, it's still part of the ocean unless it chooses to think it's not. Okay. But it's a fragment of the whole. And what it's doing is it's choosing to experience itself through these contrasts, through these absences of itself. So the purpose of our life is to experience stuff so that we can become aware of our consciousness. And we're doing that from a higher level down. We're coming down to say, I'm going to choose to experience things in the mirror because that will enrich my true knowing of myself because I'll have experienced it rather than just known it. What's the point to all of this life? And it's really simply answered. Why do you go to watch a movie? To be entertained. That's exactly what it is. Or you might go to a documentary to be informed. So the whole purpose of life is to find out more about yourself and to be entertained. You don't actually have to do anything. Okay, things will happen along the way, the same way as in a movie things happen, but you don't have to do anything. The script's already written so that it will happen to you. So why are we here? We are here to experience the third dimension. The third dimension is slowed down energy. Everything comes from source. Source is the highest vibration and all vibrations. But it started with the highest form and then it starts to slow itself down. So as you come down through dimensional levels and they're like, look, it's like a train track going from one place to another. There are train stops along the way which will have labels, but everywhere is continuous. So there's no fifth dimension and then a break and then fourth dimension and then third. It's like coming down through um, visible light. You know, if you look at a rainbow, you can't really say where red becomes orange, becomes yellow, becomes green and blue. It's a continuous shift and change. So this vibrational frequency coming down gets to a point where the more it slows down, it becomes light. And then from light, it slows down, eventually becomes sound. And from sound, it slows down and eventually becomes matter. So matter is slowed down sound in this spectrum. So the third dimension is the lowest form of vibration. Okay, and there are, there are subsonic aspects of sound below which we can't hear and we can't see and subsonic aspects of matter, but they're considered the third dimension. And the third dimension is the highest forms of density and the lowest forms of vibration in terms of this whole field. So it's, it's a way of slowing down things. And if you think about it, if somebody's talking to you really fast and you can't understand them, you say, slow down, slow down. And as they slow down their words, you get a greater understanding. So the third dimension is Source's way of getting a greater understanding of who it is by slowing down everything to a point where you can actually understand more detail. Like in a film, if I, if I run it through really fast, it all happens. But if I want a detail on a particular frame or something, I have to do it in slow motion so I can see the real detail. And I can slow it down and I can just pick one frame out and I can analyze that frame. That's all that Source is doing. Source is slowing things down into a third dimensional concept. As a child, I had repetitive visions of meteorite showers hitting the planet, repeated dreams of um, volcanoes erupting and huge lava flows and of mountain ranges rising and falling. And these were very, very powerful. And people said to me, well, look, how do you know that's not your imagination? And there's a really great test for this is to say, just imagine that you're on top of Mount Everest. You can imagine it, but you, you can't actually know what it feels like because of the lack of oxygen, because of the street cold. You, you can't feel it. 
You can just imagine it. But if I say to you, okay, now imagine that you're getting into a warm bath. Now you can feel it. You can, you can remember what the water feels like. You can remember the sensations because you've experienced it before. So the difference between imagination and recall is that you emotionally can feel the circumstances. So in all of these visions when I was seeing meteorites falling and that, I was actually feeling the sensation of being there because I'd been there in previous pole shifts. This is what I'm aware of now. So as a child, I had these very powerful um, dreams and visions that recurred over and over again. So I knew that there was some strength to that. Also around the age of 11, I became incredibly passionate about Egypt. It, and I it just was living, breathing Egypt. And I knew that um, I had an affiliation with Akhenaten, who the Egyptologists were saying was Tutankhamun's father. But that wasn't resonating with me. It's like, no, he's not. And then every time I read a book on Egypt, I would go, this isn't true. This isn't true. There was so much stuff in there that just was made up. And yet all the Egyptologists believed it. So as an 11 year old, who's gonna, who are people gonna to listen to? An 11 year old who says the, the pyramids were never tombs, the pyramids were a giant battery, um, that there's more stuff under the ground there that hasn't been discovered. And I thought I must be wrong. And it never went away. And so then I started looking for the proof uh, about Egypt. And of course, when I was younger, I couldn't really do that because I was involved in other things, but I still had this incredible uh, thing going on. And about 14, I, I first channeled, um, got taken to a spiritual circle with my parents and suddenly found myself going through this experience, which I didn't know what was happening. Fortunately, the person who was in charge of the circle did and guided me through it. And my very first guard, spirit guard, was an Egyptian priest. And that seemed quite poignant to me that at that time of my life, there was an Egyptian priest guarding me. But I became very aware that there were two streams of Egyptian priests. There was a very corrupt stream. And then there was a, a, a stream that held the, tr the sacred truths. And they were very much underground. Uh, and it was the corrupt priests that run everything, that ran everything. I then through, went through various other things where I had remembrances of uh, being um, in pole shifts before, of being in the Atlantean royal family, that uh, the first time I saw a picture of Akhenaten, I knew that that's who I'd been. But I also knew that Akhenaten was not human, that he was part of another race of an extraterrestrial race that had come here and that the whole history of Egypt was wrong. So I had to find the physical proof that could prove that all of the Egyptologists were wrong in their datings. And I found it and it's really simple. The whole Egyptian dating is based on a document written by a Greek called Manitho in around 400 BC who went to Egypt to document the history of Egypt. Um, he came there and, and found that they were talking about rulers that ruled for 20,000 years and a civilization that went back hundreds of thousands of years. And that was totally at odds with what the Greeks believed. The Greeks believed the world was only 5,000 years old. So when, when Minitho went there, there was a total mismatch. So rather than extend the Greek concept of life, he forced the Egyptian chronology into the Greek time frame and said, well, the Zeptepi, the first time where all of the gods ruled Egypt, we'll just consider that to be myth. And we're only going to date it from this particular time of, of Menes, who was the first human pharaoh. So he dated everything from there. Now, the interesting thing about that document is even that doesn't add up time-wise because there's all these missing things. And that document doesn't exist anymore. No, there's no cross-referencing of that document. What exists is three documents that are written from that that were written around about 200, I think, 200 AD. So 600 years later, there are three documents which have differences in them, 
but all Egyptologists base the history of Egypt on those three documents. So the whole history of Egypt is based on a false premise. And the Egyptologists either won't acknowledge that or don't acknowledge it. And there's a very strong reason why. They've all gone to university for, for all of this time to get professorships, all based on that. So for somebody to come out and contradict it means destroying the whole basis of that very science, if you want to call it a science. So that they will not accept anyone who is not an Egyptologist because they're not experienced, they're not qualified to do that. So that's why the documentation of Egypt is wrong. The next thing about Egypt is the physical evidence. So anyone who looks at the physical evidence will tell you that that couldn't have possibly been built by humans. There's no way known that that could have been happened. How do you move um, 2.3 million blocks that weigh anything from two to 10 tons? And they've done a check on it and said, well, if they had uh, all the population of Egypt working seven days a week, 10 hours a day during the day, it would take them uh, 20 years to build that. But the Egyptologists will tell you, oh no, but they didn't work tw you know, 12 months of the year because they were actually having to do farming for nine months of the year. So they only worked three months of the year. So suddenly when you start to work out how often they're having to put one of these two to 10 ton blocks in place, they were having to put them in one every two seconds. One, one every two seconds, it's crazy. This is what the Egyptologists will tell you. When you start to pull apart the story and you do the time frames, it just doesn't make sense. But they strictly adhere to that. And they say that they moved these massive things on, on logs. Well, where, there's no trees in Egypt, it's a desert. So where do they get all the logs from? Oh, they shipped them in from Europe. Millions of logs that they shipped in from Europe. Well, are there any logs left over? Oh no, because they burnt them all. Okay, what, they weren't planning on building any more pyramids and keeping them lying around? You know, there's so many things, it's they get the dog chasing its tail, try to cover up the stuff that doesn't lie. So the evidence is compelling that there was some sort of civilization going there, and in fact, going back hundreds of thousands of years. So I became very, very aware of that. And eventually my journey took me to Egypt and I started getting major flashbacks and remembrances, in particular when I was around red granite. Because red granite is a sign of the older civilizations. There's, there's three distinct layers that you can see there. Um, there are also, there's huge evidence of there being a giant tsunami that went up the Nile, which obliterated temples. And you'll find temples that are buried in anything from 20 to 50 feet of silt. And they try to tell you that that silt has been laid down progressively over thousands of years. Well, how does a temple that might get three inches of silt laid down in a flood one year, not get cleared away by the population so they can use the temple again, they just leave it, and then the next year another, another inch floods it, and they don't clear it away to use the temple again. They just go, no, no, let's just let the temple get slowly covered in silt by an inch a year. Doesn't make sense. Does make sense the whole thing was covered in a tsunami and there is specific evidence that will prove that. Um, and that's to do with the Santorini volcanic eruption around 1600. But before that, there were all of these temples made of polished red granite. We don't have the technology to be able to cut 10 ton blocks of red granite and polish them to the accuracy that they have. We just don't have the technology to build these temples. So someone who had a great technology did, and it was way before we came on the scene. Humans didn't build these things. So Egypt sort of pulled me back to find out the real truth of what was under the sand. And in the process of that, I connected with a number of people who were doing some scans of certain areas um, they were trying to um, get to certain places in the back door without raising the awareness of the Supreme Council of the Antiquities. Now that's a very corrupt body um, of which Zahi Awas is the, the head. 
He is a member of the Illuminati. He's become incredibly rich by uh, robbing these temples and taking artifacts uh, out of them for the purpose of the Illuminati. And I can back that up because in 2010, um, in April, there were some colleagues of mine who were uh, on the rooftop of a hotel overlooking the area of the Sphinx and the Giza Plateau. They heard an explosion in the compound. Um, they turned their cameras into the compound and they witnessed in the middle of the night tractors removing large sarcophaguses and statues from underground of the Giza Plateau. Now, why would you do these things in the middle of the night? And why has there been no disclosure from the Egyptian government about the discovery of these things? Because they're robbing them, and this is what they've been doing systematically. Whenever they find a location, they shut it off to the population. It becomes a military site. The whole Giza Plateau is a military site. It's not a, it's not a um, world classified area. It's an area that is controlled by the Egyptian military because there are things underground there that they don't want you and I to know about. There are ancient technologies, all sorts of things there. It's a massive underground complex. We, um, the people that I've been involved with, um, and I, I have in my possession, a ground penetrating radar scan of the Giza Plateau, which shows at least nine chambers under the Giza Plateau that the Egyptian government are not telling people about. I have another scan of uh, a location about 100 miles south, which is the famed location of the labyrinth. The labyrinth talked about by Manetho, which has hundreds and thousands of rooms in it that contains all sorts of technology, knowledge, astronomical charts, and the bodies of the gods that created the human race. This is according to Manetho. Um, and I have a scan showing the ground underneath this is about 10, 12 metres below the ground, which shows this catacomb of rooms. And the Egyptian government are not releasing this information. And that's just two examples. So why are they not releasing it? Because they want to be able to get in there first and rob it, to take out of it what they want, and then Zahiwas will come forward and say, oh, look, we found this new tomb, but it's been robbed in the past. And he's not lying, it has been robbed in the past but not in the distant past. It's been robbed in the last couple of years by him. And it's, that's what's going on in Egypt. There's the whole thing about um, Mubarak, who was Illuminati, the whole rebellion was caused by them. They created it because they needed a distraction. They needed to get all of the foreigners out of Egypt and they needed to get all the cameras away from the Giza Plateau and they needed to be able to have a justification for putting more military around the Giza Plateau. So they created this distraction about an uprising so that they could go in and take the bigger things out of the ground without anyone knowing. And that's what the whole January uprising was really about. So there's stuff going on and people think that it's, you know, it's the people rising up. No, the people are being controlled to do these sorts of things because they want you to look here while they're doing something over here that I want you to know about, which was the whole building of the Aswan Dam, both of them. They built the Aswan Dam purely so that they could have all of this machinery around and they could shift all of these temples and save them. But what they were really doing was going into the temples and removing all of the stuff out of it, but they needed a cover story. So that's what the cover story was. And this goes on all the way through the American Civil War, all to do with cotton and all manipulation, all of these things. You can find huge examples of that. They've been systematically robbing these things for thousands of years, but they can only get to what they can get to with their technologies. So of course, thousands of years ago, they could only get into some of the surface area and they weren't really aware of a lot of the spaces underground. But now with ground penetrating radar and satellite scans, they can locate every single location in Egypt where these places are. And a lot of them, they're locating them because many of these places have um, energy sources in them, like free energy generators. And so they show up as these flashes on the scale. 
So they use the um, American CIA satellites because the CIA is the Illuminati. So they're using these satellites to scan Egypt to find the locations of all of this. And then it's a matter of, okay, we're gonna seal off this area and systematically go through and rob them. And that's what they do. They find numerous things. They'll find um, what we would term alien technologies, energy sources, um, uh, and some of these are often uh, depicted on the walls in some of the, uh, the tombs. For instance, at Dendra, they have this massive big, um, looks like a, a cathode ray, uh, tube, which they've used to light things and do things. So th they're after the technologies. Uh, the reason they're after the technologies is because they don't want us to have it, because they want to exploit us. And if we had free technologies, they couldn't exploit us. So they don't want us to have it, so they keep it to themselves. They're also very tied into the occult and symbolism. So they want all of the statues and everything. They're also very, very, they want the gold because the gold is useful to them to convert into monoatomic gold. So they're the things that they want and they don't want us to have them. I think it was 2003 or 2004, scientists discovered that when you put a particular process to gold and you heated it a particular way, that instead of gold having the normal crystalline structure that it has, it would form monatomic lines of gold. And that when it was in that form, which was a white powder, it had incredible superconductivity anti-gravitational and it had all of these amazing effects and incidentally that when you ate it that it created heightened levels of awareness and prolonged life and when you go back and you read things like uh, the Bible and the Quran and all this they talk about the manna as being a white powder that this powder that they ate that they would make into bread and eat which would give them long life and give them heightened levels of awareness. So this comes from sort of the Anunnaki. That was their purpose of mining gold, was because that they could convert it into monoatomic gold. And there's various things you can read on the net that say, oh, it doesn't work, you shouldn't eat it, and all of that. Well, the Illuminati don't want everybody to know that they can get monoatomic gold and eat it and become heightened awareness. So they create all this misinformation about it. So that's what monoatomic gold is about. Look, I suppose channeling is different for different people. Um, for me, what it is, is you're connecting to a higher aspect of yourself. Um, for other people, they're connecting to a separate entity. But it's interesting because often those people who talk about channeling will also talk about that the whole universe consciousness is a oneness. So there seems to be a a contradiction in terms when they say they're channeling a separate entity and yet they also acknowledge that everything is one. And the explanation for that is that all you're doing is just channeling, your, channeling a higher aspect of yourself. And depending on what you say you're channeling is dependent on where your filters are. Because we all run filters that help us experience our life without precognition. For instance, if you're meant to experience going through some traumatic event, but you have total pre-warning that it's going to happen, your experience of it will be changed because of your pre-knowledge of it. So therefore you will filter the knowledge of it to allow yourself to experience the true emotions of going through it first. So we do run filters to allow that to happen. A lot of that's happening with light workers concerning 2012. So channeling is really where you are tapping into higher awarenesses and bringing that information through either for yourself or for another person. You may channel information through to them to help them awaken or, or go through what they need to go through. Some people actually are tapped into a ritual. You know, they can't channel unless they go through a ritual, um, but they don't have to do that. Um, they may do it the first time as a tool to get them there. But once they've done that, it, it should make no difference. I know for me, when it started to happen, it was something that happened to me. And from that moment on, 
all I had to do was basically just flick the switch on. And sometimes I didn't do that. Sometimes it would just be happening and I couldn't even control it. Sometimes I would walk into a shop and I'd be talking to somebody behind the counter and then suddenly I'd be told to tell them all this information. So you have certain control over it and you don't. When you realize the more open you are spiritually, the channel is running all the time. You know, Source often says, there's nothing different between me talking to someone who's a channel and me talking to somebody who gets nothing. I'm talking to everyone every second of the day. He said, some people are listen and some people don't. And that's okay. I just keep talking to everyone. You know, there's no hierarchy. You don't have to go through a priest or a religion or anything that to access God or whatever you want to call it. Allah, Allah is in, you are Allah. You are connected all the time. So the channeling process is so simple for everyone. All you have to do is listen to your inner voice. That's the first way to start. And, it, and often it comes through very subtly, very subtly. It's just a hint of something. And most of us will brush it out of our mind and not listen to it. But then down the track, we go, oh, I knew I should have trusted my gut instinct or I should have done. Yeah, I had a feeling about that. So everyone gets it, but most people brush it off. But once you learn to hone into it, it's like, let's say there's a really fuzzy image and you go, oh, I can't really see it. I'm not going to bother. But the more you focus on it, the more you can bring it in to focus and then it becomes crystal clear and the picture becomes very strong. So you learn to be able to, to focus in on it and everyone can do that. It's no big deal. Religions were a means by which the priests or the, the, the people who had the sacred knowledge could control the masses. So what they do is they take away the true essence of knowledge of connection to oneness from the people. Now you can't get it unless you come through me because I'm going to take all the sources from it away from you. But not only can't you not get it from me is I'm going to play around with it and encode it in such way that unless you're initiated by me into understanding the code, then you're going to read it one way and not the way it's really meant. So it's written in two ways so that only the initiated can understand the symbologies behind it. So let's, let's look at the, the first, I'm not going to go to the ancient Egyptian mystery schools and what happened with the whole tracing of the Trat Tat Brotherhood or the Babylon Brotherhood as, as David Icke calls it, um, and then how it got uh, distorted by the Amun priests. The Amun priests pulled it in one direction and for their own corrupt methods and, and then where it went and everywhere. I'll go to the first religion. First religion was Judaism and there was no Hebrew tribe and all, all of this is all constructed. But let's understand the, the facts of who Moses really was. Because the first five chapters of the Old Testament were supposedly written by Moses. But who was Moses? We know that he was in an Egyptian family, an Egyptian royal family. Um, we know that he was supposedly found on a, on a a river in as a baby. Well, that story goes back to Sargon in the Sumerians era. Like, so that's a borrowed story. So who was he really and how did that religion came about? Well, one of the things I've put down in, in my book, Red Granite, which was channeled information came through, is that there was a vizier and at, at the time of around about 1600 BC, curiously enough, there was a division in Egypt and Lower Egypt, or the northern part if we look at it, was ruled by invaders from the east called the Hyksos, or sometimes referred to as the Habaru. And you can see how Habaru can be distorted to Hebrew. And in the um, southern part of Egypt, or Upper Egypt, was the descendants of the original Egyptians who had the true sacred knowledges. So there were two pharaohs. The pharaoh in the north was a pharaoh called a Popey. And he had a vizier called Joseph, who was one of these Habaru um, invaders from the, the east. Now, Joseph is the Joseph we know as of Joseph in the Technicolor Dreamcoat. Okay, the Joseph who had all the dreams. And Joseph um, was sent by his pharaoh to go to southern Egypt to get the sacred knowledge from the southern pharaoh, Sequenera. 
he had the ancient rituals of resurrection. So he had the true sacred knowledge of what was really going on. And the northern one didn't have it. So he wanted to feel that he was a true pharaoh and have this resurrection right. So he said to Joseph, I need to get this information. Joseph sent two of his brothers down to southern Egypt to see the pharaoh to get the information. And they finished up murdering Sequinara because they couldn't get it. They were angry with him. They tried to beat it out of him and they killed him. And there's a great book called The Hiram Key by Christopher Knight and Jonathan Lomas, I think it is, which details that because they were actually trying to find the origins of Freemasonry. So they found a lot of these clues there. And what they found was that Joseph, in fact, had ordered his brothers to go down there and get this information. The next bit of information they didn't have was what happened next. What happened was the southern pharaohs, uh, the son of um, Sequinera, Kamos, created, a, there was a civil war. They wanted revenge for the death of their father. So they caused an uprising against the northern pharaoh. And a civil war ensued. And Joseph, because they were losing, packed up his bags, stole as much gold as he could, and took about 6,000 other Habaru people, invaders, and they fled Egypt, chased by now the pharaoh from the south, Kamos. And they fled at the very same time that the volcanic eruption in Santorini was going off. Okay, so these things were linked together. And that link was happening at the same time as Nibiru was passing through. So all of these events were happening at the one time, 1600 BC. Joseph flees with all of the gold and all of those bits. And he also took with him a cast, a cabinet, which they call an ark, which inside it had a giant crystal that used to sit inside the so-called sarcophagus inside the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid. So he stole this crystal because it had incredible transmitting powers inside this ark. This is the Ark of the Covenant. So he steals this crystal and the Egyptians are furious about this, not just because he's killed the southern pharaoh, but for other reasons, obviously, because he's stolen it. So they, they get chased across and he goes, and most people think that Mount Sinai is in the Sinai Peninsula, you know, the, the, where Moses went to the, get the Ten Commandments. It's not. It's in Saudi Arabia. It's across the Red Sea. And there's evidence there. It was discovered in 1984. And if you go onto YouTube, you can actually see footage of the people who discovered it and images of it. It's in Saudi Arabia. Um, so Joseph goes across and he flees and the Pharaoh gets trapped in one of the tsunamis that goes through and kills him. His younger brother Amos then sets up the beginning of the 18th dynasty. Okay. Um, but Joseph's now fled and he's across the water and he's trying to keep control because he's used to being in control and he's a megalomaniac and he's got all of these people who are on the verge of internal fighting. Where are we going to go? What are we going to do? So he goes to the top of the mountain there and there's a Midianite god in that area and the Midianite god is a god of revenge and anger and all of these things. So he goes to the top of the mountain and he says, what am I thinks? What am I going to do to control all of these people? So he says, I know what I'm going to do. And he chisels out onto two stone tablets, seven commandments, not ten, seven, one for each day of the week. And if you look at the ten commandments, seven of them are day to day things. And three of them are big ones like thou shalt have no other God but me, thou shalt worship no other idols but me, and I can't remember what the third one is. So there's seven day-to-day -day ones, and there's three basic ones. So he chisels out seven of them, and he chisels them out in Egyptian hieroglyphics, because Egyptian hieroglyphics are the words of the gods. And he comes down off the mountain, and he finds 
they've melted down the gold into a golden calf and they worship one of the old images from Egypt. And he's furious because he doesn't have control anymore. So he smashes the tablets and said, you're going to be smitten by this God that I met up there, who's this God of revenge and evil and does all of this, which is what the Christian or the, 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 he, the um, Jewish God is, which is a midnight God. So he then says, I'm going to go back up to the top of the mountain and I'm going to pray and I'm going to negotiate with God for your salvation. So he goes back up to the top of the mountain, but this time he takes with him a whole lot of parchment because he realizes he's going to have to have more rules. So he goes to the top of the mountain and this time he chisels out 10. The seven he had before and three more. You shall worship no other God but me. You shall have no idols. You know, there's the big three. He adds those in and he writes down a whole lot of pedantic little stuff, which becomes the basis of the Torah and the, all, of their, all of their rules that they have. And he comes down off the mountain, he says, here's the Ten Commandments and here's the, all of the other rules that you have to have. And I am now called Moses. Moses meaning born of. That's what it means. It's an Egyptian name that means born of. We don't know born of who, but he says, I'm born of the God or whatever. And, he's, and he becomes the ruler because he's the keeper. And that's how Judaism came about. Christianity is a different thing. Christianity was, and we have to understand first of all who Jesus was. Now Jesus uh, was a real person and wasn't a real person, okay? Because the stuff that you read in the Bible goes back to 12, 13, 14 other religions going back 1500 years before Christianity. The whole birth story comes from a whole lot of different things. Everything about Jesus that's in the Bible comes from somewhere else. It's all been made up. But was there a particular person that those stories talk about? And yes, there was, but we have to understand who that person really was and why things happened the way they did. So let's look at who Jesus, Jesus was called. He had the title, the Son of God and the King of Kings. Now the title, the Son of God, comes from Egypt. It was a title reserved for the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh was called the Son of God. And the title, the King of Kings, had its origins from the Roman Empire, in particular, Caesar. He was the King of Kings. He was the ruler of the Roman Empire. Okay? There's only ever been one person in history who had the title, Son of God, King of Kings. And that person was the son of Julius Caesar and Cleopatra. And his name was Caesarian. And he was born around about 40-odd BC. We can't say exactly the date because there were three different calendars going on, but we know around that period he was, built, he was born. And when Caesar was murdered, Cleopatra, he, Augustus sent out um, uh, assassins to kill Caesarian, to kill the offspring of Caesar so that Augustus could be the rightful heir. And while Caesarian was still alive, Caesarian was the rightful heir of the Roman Empire. So Augustus sent out people to kill him. And there are two reports. One that says that um, a Caesarian was killed and another one that says that he escaped. Now, if you were sent out by Caesar to say, did you kill him? You would come back saying, oh, yes, he's dead. Because if you didn't achieve your goal, you're going to be killed. Do you remember in Snow White when the queen sends the woodcutter out to get the heart? And he can't do it, but he comes back with another heart and says, yes, yes, I did it. It's the same thing. Cleopatra is totally aware of what's going on. So she sends Caesarian, who is then a child of about 11 and 12, away to the Far East in the, in the protection of her two most trusted servants, male and female. And they become foster parents to Caesarian. And he goes off to the Far East, and there are d documents saying that Caesarian arrived in Nepal and studied Buddhism, or studied the Hindu teachings, because Buddhism came later, but studied the Vedic teachings of the ancient Sumerians and all of that, in Nepal for about 25 years, 20 years or something like that. 
and in that time changed his name to Iesu. Pretty powerful stuff, isn't it, that someone would do that? Then went back to Egypt when he was 30, where he sought out his half-sister because Cleopatra had had twins to Mark Antony and then another son as well. So the twins were Cleopatra Selena and um, Ptolemy Philomata or 15, I think it was. I can't remember which was which. And they were twins. So he goes back and he finds them and he marries his half-sister, which was the custom of the ancient Egyptians because that kept everything in the bloodline because all of this sacred knowledge was inherited through the, the female of the race in the DNA. Okay, that's a whole other story. So we get this situation. He goes back and he marries his half-sister and he has a half-brother who is a twin. Okay, now there's this, all this speculation that Jesus had a twin brother. And it's in the, it says it's in the Bible. And so people say, oh, Jesus had a twin brother. No, he had a brother who was a half-brother who was a twin of his wife, who was his half-sister. Okay, so here they then go off to Jerusalem because where is he going to, to try and put this new teaching, this new understanding he has through? He's the rightful ruler of the Roman and um, Egyptian empires. So that whole region he's the rightful ruler to and he has an incredible philosophy of love and sharing and all of that. So he goes with his sister and his half-brother, a sister who's his wife, and they go to Jerusalem or to Qumran and they form the core of the Essenes and their teachings. And people recognize him. Are you the son of God? Well, you say I am. He denies it because if he knows it, then he's going to be killed. But the Romans know who he is. Okay. And the Pharisees know who he is because he knows the truth about the Judaic religion. So he writes a whole lot of scrolls. They write a whole lot of scrolls and they bury them in various places around the place. One of those got discovered as the Dead Sea Scrolls, which was about 500 texts and all this. Another lot of them got buried underneath where the tomb of Solomon supposedly was in uh, Jerusalem. Those scrolls were discovered by the Knights Templar in 1118 and taken to, Fr taken to Scotland in 1307 and they are now buried beneath Rosslyn Chapel and they tell the truth. They don't want the truth out there so they're not digging them up and if they do dig them up you're never going to know about it. Now the question is did Jesus die on the cross? There's a lot of evidence to support that he didn't, that he might have been crucified, but he got taken down off the cross because it was Passover and you weren't allowed to have people up on there. But the whole story of being putting in the tomb and resurrection, again, that's borrowed. That's borrowed. So there is a lot of evidence to suggest that Christ or Caesarean and Mary Magdalene or his wife, Mary Selena, left Qumran. His brother stayed preaching who was James, who was the, the younger brother. Um, and they went, and Mary Selena and that, and, her, and the father, Joseph of Arimathea, Joseph who was the foster father that looked after him, all went off through Greece, where they have connections with the, the Delphic people in Greece, that they went to southern France, and then they made their way across to um, Wales, southern England and Ireland and where they passed on the information. Lots of evidence to support that. The Roman Catholic Church, however, developed because the Romans didn't want this information to come out and they needed to form a religion to control the people again. So they created a religion out of the myth of this man and to suppress the knowledge of who Jesus really was. They wanted to suppress the knowledge of what Caesarean knew which was the ancient knowledge of the Tat Brotherhood and whatever. So it's a massive cover up all the way through. And that sort of covers um, Christianity and all the offshoots of that which have happened.
Muhammad was another megalomaniac who wanted to have control. He, he wanted to be important. He wanted to be important. So he created a religion. And in fact, he said that the whole prophecies of Jesus and all of these things were true. But he wanted to control things in a time when um, that area of the world was chaotic. And he wanted to be a powerful person to control everything. So he went around saying, I'm acting on behalf of the prophet. I'm acting on behalf of Allah and I'm killing people. And if you don't believe me, I'll kill you. Well, that's what all the religions have done. If you don't believe me, we're going to kill you. So you do that enough, people will start out of fear to believe you. So all of those main three religions were all created by megalomaniacs who wanted to control or big note themselves. And their way of doing it was to threaten everyone. And the core teaching is there is to love one another. OK, that's the core teaching because it comes from the highest aspects. And all the highest aspects have come through all the way through. They come through love one another. But the minute you start ritualizing it, the minute you start controlling it with hierarchies of who can get to what and who can't, now you're bringing in fear. And it's using fear to control the masses. If you don't do this, you'll go to hell. If you don't do this, you'll get your head cut off. If you don't follow the laws exactly, you're going to go to hell, you're going to get stoned, you're going to do, do it. So now you're controlling people by fear, not by love, which is totally against the core aspect of all simple religions, which says to love one another. So all the stuff that's been added, which people say is the word of God, is not the word of God. It's the word of various people trying to put themselves up and control. And where does that come from? That's the Illuminati coming in and taking control and setting things up. And once you've created two or three religions, well, you can set them against one another. And that's why they created countries. Because now you can set countries against each other. And the thing is, the Illuminati create all the wars on the planet. And they've created them all since 1300. Okay? Because the Illuminati are the very first weapons merchants. They, were, they became so rich because of discoveries they made in the Crusades that they became richer than the state, richer than the church, and they were the power brokers in Europe. And they were the weapons manufacturers. So they sold weapons to everyone, and they're still doing it. The Illuminati supplied weapons to the Nazis and the Americans in the Second World War. And every single other war that you want to name, if you follow the paper trail, it all comes back to the same people. We're supplying weapons to both sides. So, of course, the more wars they are, the more money they make. And because they control the governments, what they do is they set the governments up against one another and they manufacture wars that aren't there so that they can continue to exploit the people, keep them controlled, because while they're fighting wars against one another, whether it's be religion or whatever it is, they can keep making money out of them and just exploit them. Exploit, 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 use, use, use. And that's why they think people are stupid. The greatest answer to that is, define what God is first, and then I can tell you whether I believe in it or whether it exists. Because everyone has a totally different answer to that of what God is. Some people see God as a separate being that is all powerful that they have to submit to. Some people don't even believe there's a God. And you say, well, how do you explain the whole universe and everything? They'll come up with science's explanation. And science's explanation is changing every 24 hours as they come up with new information. Science is something that continually proves itself wrong. That's what science is. And you only have to look at the history of science. 100 years ago, man couldn't fly. Impossible. Oh, now man can. More than that, we're going to the, but we can't fly to the moon. We can't leave the planet. Oh, we've done that too. Okay. Science continually proves itself wrong. And the more science goes down the track, the more they're realizing that what the spiritualists are saying is actually true. Because this universe does not exist in reality. It only exists in perceived reality. You know, you can watch a film 
what you're watching now is just dots of light reflecting on your retina. I'm not real. I'm not real. I'm just dots of light. But if you perceive it to be real, then you will believe that I'm a real person telling you real things. But it's not. It's a perception. It's part of that choosing to experience. It's part of the illusion. The current Illuminati or the original Illuminati? Because there was, the, the name Illuminati originally came from being illuminated, i.e. aware, awakened of the truths of it. And as happens in all the time, power corrupts. And within that, there are a group of people who wanted a, they had a better vision of the world. And they felt that the only way that they could do that was to control the people. But in doing that, the ultimate power corrupts everything. So they became controlling to the point where they believe that they're right and everyone else is wrong. Now, and they also are very much controlled by the Drakos in terms of their agendas. And they've worked their way through and they control every government, every major corporation, you name it, it's all controlled and it all filters back to a handful of families. And it's all to do with the bloodline. So we're talking about the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, the JP Morgans, the royal families of uh, Egypt, uh, uh, royal families of uh, Europe. They're all tied into this bloodline. And that bloodline happens to be reptilian. It's a reptilian bloodline. Uh, and that's why we're so aware of people like George Bush and the Queen and that being able to shape shift. People have seen them doing these reptilian shifts and going, whoa, because they're of that bloodline. So they're controlling everything through, through fear. What's their agenda? Ultimately, their agenda is they want to get into the fifth dimension. But along the way, it's all about just control everything and, and keep the sheeple as sheeple. Ultimately, the Dracos are at the top of the tree. Um, they've been around in this universe for about four or five billion years. And because they've been around that long, they, they think they own this universe. And they go from planet to planet like a, like a locust. You know, they'll go there and they strip it of all of its resources. And if there's a population there, they just infest themselves until they control the population. And then they strip the planet of its resources. So they're, they're like, um, uh, like a plague of locusts that go around and they believe they have a right to do all of this. So they can do whatever they want. And, and they've genetically engineered the human race as a Trojan horse to try to get into the upper realms. Because they're fear-based um, and they're, they're reptilian, it's like the, the reptilian brain we have, which is about pure survival and control and manipulation and all of those things, survival of the fittest and all of that, and lacking in emotion. They don't have emo emotion. So they can't access higher realms. But because they want to control everything, they think, well, we can't have a dimension in this universe that we can't control. So we have to control it. We have to invade it. We have to do what we do. So that's their agenda. It's not right or wrong. It's just that's their way of thinking. You know, we say when we see a snake attack a rabbit and kill it, the snake's not doing anything evil. It's just doing what a snake does. So the Dracos aren't evil. That's a judgment that people put on them. Okay, they're not evil. They're just doing what they do. And they're fulfilling the role of being the fear-based thing for the third dimension. They're playing out the bad guy that we need to experience stuff in the third dimension. Because if we didn't have that, there would be no third dimension. We'd all be in fifth dimension going, isn't, isn't everything wonderful? Their physical form and, um, and spiritual form, because they're lower fourth dimensions, which means they can be in third dimension, fourth, lower fourth dimension. So they're capable of shape shifting. So there will be a physical reptilian form, but they will look to you as if they're human. They can also, their consciousness can oversee a physical human form like a shadow. 
Okay, so the, the, see, we get so locked into thinking that our human body is solid. And science tells us it's not. It's 99.9% .9 space. Okay, but we perceive it's solid because of our own filters. So therefore, it's quite possible for another entity to exist in the same space that you exist. And if your f switches are switched on, then they can control you through those, like a remote control. But if you flick those switches off, they can't control you. In order to switch off the, the DNA, because within your DNA you've got all sorts of different switches, and it's like a, a giant airplane cockpit, they're everywhere. You know, some of them are the thrusters, some of them are the navigators, some of them is a fuel gauge to see how much energy you've got. They've all got a purpose. And some of those switches are reptilian that says, well, we're going to totally control everything through the reptilian switches. So the way to do it is you go into, you do a visualization, a meditation, whatever it is you want to do, and you go in there and you physically find those switches and you flick them off. You turn them off. And once they're turned off, they can't activate. If you want to, you can rip the whole wiring out. Whatever you want to do to, to deactivate that, you can. And then you can look around and you can find the aspects of your higher self. You know, they might be over here glowing in gold and, so, and you flick them on and turn them on full so that you allow yourself to be in a full level of awareness. Because it's all there, you can do whatever you want. It's your cockpit. If, if we had a whole lot of nine foot tall reptilians walking around the planet, people would freak out, okay? So what better way to control the masses than to have an organization of hybrid forms that appear to be human, but are totally controlled by you or you're part of their running their agenda, and they do all the dirty work for you, under the guise of being good. See, we have a United Nations, and the United Nations is a Dracos-run organization. But if you tell the people they're doing good things and you publicize, and this is where controlling the media helps as well, if you publicize all of the good things that you do here, while at the same time you're totally ripping the shit out of everything down here, people only see that. Because very few people will dig deeper to find out what's really going on. Very few people have dug deep to understand that the AIDS virus and Ebola virus and swine flus and all these things were actually created by these people. And it's documented. It's documented that the World Health Organization, which is an offshoot of the United Nations, they created these viruses for a purpose, to pull the population down. They have an agenda to bring the world population down. But most people don't dig any deeper. They lead superficial lives. People just have to dig around for themselves, you know, go onto YouTube, take everything with a pinch of salt, you know, don't, don't believe everything that you see, everything you hear, but importantly, don't disbelieve it either. Run it through your own filters. And you know, there's a simple thing, if it looks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, and it walks like a duck, it's probably a duck. You know, um, the most simple answer is usually the, the most appropriate one. So the more that you're seeing bullshit and the more your stuff doesn't seem to add up, go deeper. There'll be a reason behind it, why somebody's trying to hide something. And often it's not what people tell you, it's what they don't tell you. And this is where NASA is brilliant because NASA you know, will tell you some things, but then they won't tell you other stuff. So the best thing that people can do is ask questions. Don't believe everything you're told, find out for yourself. Go onto the internet, go into YouTube, grab some books, read up, become informed, informed through your own processes and tap into your higher knowledge. Run it through your own filter, read something and put your hand on your heart and say, does that resonate for me, yes or no? And you'll get an answer straight away. And it might totally contradict logic, but it's your higher self telling you, no, 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 that's not true. That's a cover up, whatever it is. That's the best way to do it. If you go into Google Earth, you know, and then in Google Earth, you can punch in your street directory and 
it brings up a map and you can even see a photo. Someone's driven a car and taken photos along all of these streets so you can actually see your house on Google Earth. It's pretty trippy. This is the level of control that these guys have. They've been able to not only map the Earth by satellite, and they have satellites that can zero in and read a book. If you're sitting in a park, right, reading a book, their technology is so powerful that they can actually read what you're reading. That's how much they can zoom in, okay? So they've got satellites all around the planet, all the time looking at what's going on in all spectrums. So they've been able to create Google Earth as a byproduct, and everyone says, oh, it's great. Yeah, we want these satellites because we've got Google Earth. Well, let's look at all the subversive things that they can do with it. You know, that's what they're not telling you. And who's in control of this? NASA, which is not a government organization. It's a private organization, totally funded and owned by the Illuminati. And there are factions within it. There's the Nazis and the CIA, and there's all these different factions in NASA, because that's exactly the way the reptilian world works. Everyone's fighting to be the leader and the controller. So they have their own little factions in it. In a love-based environment, there is no leader because everyone contributes and they do what is in the best interests of everything. As well as they have Google Earth, if, if you go to certain places in Google Earth, it's blacked out. Let's say that I've got a zit on my head, right? And I don't want people to see the zit. What do I do? I cover it up in makeup so you can't see it. So they've got Google Earth, they control all of this. They can say, okay, let's just take those frames out and let's put in some blank earth. We'll airbrush it. Because we can control that, we can do what we want. But there are other areas that they do black out and you can't see. That's when it becomes interesting when you go to Google Sky because Google Sky is with all the satellites that they've put up in the air, they've got all of these images of the whole galaxy. You can see the whole galaxy from there through their satellites in normal spectrum and in infrared spectrum. And that's where it becomes interesting because you've got this section in Virgo which has been censored out by a black square. Sorry, what do they not want us to see? A star? what's in behind the black square that they don't want to see. And in fact, you may have been able to track down through some of the other links that I've got that there's a binary star system behind there. Well, that's no big deal. Why would they block out a binary star system? Because there are other binary star systems. So the only conclusion is, it's not that there's some supernova going on there or something happening on it. The only conclusion that you can come to as to why that section is blacked out, is there must be something coming from there that they don't want you to see. Now it could be an object, and that object could be a natural object, like a comet or something like that, which was on a collision course with Earth or something like that, and they don't want us to see it. It's not the most likely option. The most likely option is that there's a fleet of ships coming from that area. Oh, we don't want people to know that because if there was an object like a comet, well, we've got comets coming around all the place, so we wouldn't worry about that. The only reason that you would block out part of the sky would be if there was some sort of alien force or presence coming this way from that star system. Because if you knew that, then you'd start asking all sorts of questions. Best we just black it out. They think most people are stupid, that they, they don't even know Google Sky exists, and they wouldn't even know to look in that constellation. And they've also got a huge big black band going down through there. So most people would just go, oh, it's obviously some sort of fault or some area that's blacked out or something like that. And it's not really any interest anyway, it's just a star. Most people are just gonna fob it off. They're not, then you're gonna have less than 0.01% of the population who are capable of having access to that technology that will be interested. And especially if you keep them too busy with having to pay their bills and whether they're gonna pay food, or they're not even gonna be interested. 
because it's not relevant to them. It doesn't affect their day-to-day -day life. Perfect example. When an earthquake happens in Chile, everyone goes, oh, that's terrible. And they go back to their day-to-day -day life because it doesn't personally affect them. Okay? We don't worry about what happens with the neighbours next door because it doesn't personally affect us. We're so disconnected. We're so separate from it. That's why we generate cancers. Because we're so disconnected from who we are that a part of our body can go, whoa, wake up, wake up. You're getting out of control. And we're so separated from it. We think it's something that's happened to us rather than the fact that we have manifested it as a wake-up call. All cancer is self-generated. All cancer can be healed by reharmonizing the body with frequency. And the medical profession know this, and they're not telling you. Why? Because who controls the medical profession? The pharmaceutical industry controls the medical profession. And who owns the pharmaceutical industry? Gee, the same guys who are doing all the cyanide gas in Germany. The Nazis. Who's that? Oh, that's the Illuminati. So the Illuminati control the pharmaceuticals and they control medicine and they control everything. And their whole objective is, we don't want to heal you. We want to keep you sick for your whole life. We want you to live longer, but we want you to be sick for all of your life because we make money out of you. So therefore, we'll also create insurance companies and then we'll force you to have medical insurance. So now you've got to pay for the medical insurance and you've got to pay for everything. So we've got you tied up from every direction. And we better squash all the natural remedy people because we don't want people to know that they could actually heal themselves and they could actually prevent healing. So we're going to try and eradicate them. First of all, we're going to try to make them sound like witch doctors. Okay, that didn't work. Now we're going to try to pull them in under our umbrella so we can control them. So we've just passed legislation that vitamins are now considered toxins. Because if you take too many vitamins, they can be detrimental to your health. Therefore, we're going to call them toxins. And now because they're toxins, we can control them. And you're not allowed to take vitamins anymore because we control them. That's what they've done. World Health Organization's done that. Slipped in under the net because we don't care. Doesn't affect us. Give you an, an image of a single celled organism compared to the whole planet. That the sing single celled organism is really only aware of its immediate environment. Well, we're the single celled organism. And in fact, we're not even the single-celled organism because our earth is a consciousness. The same way that we think that our body is where one consciousness. But every single cell in our body is an individual organism. It can function on its own. It has mitochondria and all these things in it. it it's, it's a separate consciousness. That's why you can take the heart out of something and it keeps beating because it's still got a consciousness about it and parts of the body will still move. They have this residual consciousness. But over the top of that, we have an imposed consciousness of ourself. Okay, so we control all of these individual things. We're the head of it all. Well, Gaia, Earth consciousness, is the same. It controls all the consciousnesses on the planet. And the sun, because the sun is 99% of the mass in our solar system, it is the overseeing consciousness that controls all the planets and all the things in our solar system. Well, our solar system is a blip in the Milky Way galaxy. And the Milky Way galaxy has a consciousness that oversees all of the solar systems in our Milky Way galaxy. And our Milky Way galaxy is part of a local cluster of galaxies which has a consciousness. And that local cluster has a consciousness. And that local cluster is part of an even bigger and bigger and bigger. So where does it all end? Specifically relevant to us, there is a galactic federation, for want of a better term, which is a group of um, fifth, seventh, ninth, eleventh dimensional existences 
who oversee what happens in this galaxy. And the overriding rule is that free will must apply, that no one is allowed to interfere with the free will of any being. Everything is, everyone is allowed to express whatever they want to express. That does not negate cause and effect. Okay, if you jump in a fire, you get burnt, cause and effect. If you kill someone, someone may retaliate against you. You know, there's cause and effect. Um, if you, you break your arm because you do things, there's cause and effect, but it's not right or wrong. The higher consciousnesses have this guardianship to ensure that free will happens. But they understand, for instance, that the Drakos are playing the role they have to play as the bad guy because we see ourselves as a good guy. And so they are, allow that to happen. It's more, um, the galactic federations are more funnels of consciousness. Does that make sense? That the information funnels in oneness. So even though it's oneness, there, there's, there are s levels of perception that you can choose to see things. Okay, just, sorry, I'm just getting images coming through. You can stand and look out of the window of the first floor of a skyscraper and you will see certain things. You can take the elevator up to the 10th floor and now you can see more. You can go right to the very top and you can see everything. So your perception will change and what you can see and be aware of changes depending on where you shift your perception to. And all of these different dimensional levels and the federations are all levels of perception. And they allow the play to unfold at different levels. It's like a play within a play within a play within a play within a play. And it's all allowed to unfold at that dimensional level. And we've seen films of plays within plays. Well, that's a level upon a level upon a level. What was the one? Inception? Perfect example of how things work at those dimensional levels. Most definitely. Look, this is a really exciting time to be here. Some of these beings, they merely just have to think and they're here because time space does not exist to them once you get to those dimensional levels of existence. Some beings, though, are still in three dimensional form and fourth and fifth dimensional form. That's why we have solid um, UFOs and we have light ships. There's difference. Some are three dimensional, some are fifth dimensional means of transport. So the, the more um, the light ships, for instance, they need to travel at the speed of light and then the um, other ships, they use different physics to get here. So some of the beings who have a vested interest in what's happening on the planet or is about to happen, this is a really exciting time to be here. Okay, this is a, this is a very exciting time, not because of what's going to happen to the planet per se, because that happens fairly regularly, it's no big deal. But what is a big deal is the shift of consciousness that's happening. That's really interesting to watch. And they want to make sure that this human consciousness, which has been a byproduct of this hybridization, okay, the consciousness that you and I have is a hybridized form. So it's created something quite extraordinary and new. Emotions. Emotions that can generate music, can generate literature, can generate art. This is new. This is why the human race is something quite extraordinary because there's the detrimental aspects of, of um, emotions, but there's also this other amazing stuff. So they want to come through because this is exciting, but they want to be careful that they don't allow a virus in that can affect all of these other things. So there's very much a possibility that the human race will be admitted to the next dimensional level, but with conditions like a quarantine parole period to see whether you know, it's like border control. Well, let's let them in, but let's keep them isolated to see whether there's any infection, cross-infection goes on, or is, or is it going to be all purely good? Well, that's what everyone's caught up with. They've got caught up with this idea that we have to ascend to fifth dimension. And it's, it's the, the perspective is to understand you're all dimensions. Because if you're oneness, there is only one spectrum and it's all connected. 
but it depends on where you choose to view it from. Now, people who are choosing to think that they're this drop of water separated from the ocean will then think they have to make a journey back to the ocean, not understanding that they have all of the contents of the ocean in them. You know, I can say to someone, okay, they're giving me an image. Let's say we've got the ocean and the ocean is God, which is all dimensions. And then I take a massive bathtub load of water out of it. And I go, okay, that's seventh dimension. And then I take a, a small bucket and I take a bucket out of the tub and I go, okay, there's fifth dimension. And then I take an a, a eyedropper and I take a drop of water out of the bucket or out of the cup and I go, okay, there's third dimension. So they're all part of the one, but it all degrees on where your perspective of separation is. So fifth dimension, you can't ascend to the fifth dimension because you already are fifth dimension. You're already seventh dimension. You're already tenth dimension. You can be whatever dimension you think to create. You can create a billion dimensions if you want. And they all exist if you create them because that's what source is doing. Just pure thought. So it creates, you know, fractals. And you just keep going in and keep going in and keep going in and keep going in and they just keep repeating over and over and over and over and over and over again. It's not bad at all, it's essential. Because it's the very first thing that Source did. Is it created, it separated from itself to create the absence of itself so that it had a mirror and a duality. It's, it's the absolute essential mirror separation. But it doesn't mean you have to stay there. It just means at the maximum point of separation, you have the maximum amount of conflict. Therefore, you have the greatest scope for experience. Separation is neither bad nor good. But the function of separation is to give you the maximum experience of not being connected to love. See, if you say to Source, I want to be rich, Source says, okay, I'll make you poor first. Because you need to know what it's like to be poor before you can appreciate what rich is. Oh, I need, I need to know what it is to be healthy. Okay, well, we need to make you unhealthy first so that you have a contrast. Because if you don't have a contrast, you have nothing to compare it to. You don't know what healthy is. You don't know what happy is. You don't know any of these things until you've had the contrast. Well, the more separation you create, the greater appreciation you have for what it is to be totally in oneness. But it's that separation that creates all of the scale of level of experience. It's just an enrichment. So when people are totally separated, they're that the maximum level of conflict, maximum level of fear, maximum level of experience. They'll get sick of it eventually, which is exactly what happens to people. They get sick of it and bored with it and they want to come back to be happy. I don't want separation. I want us all to be one. I want to do, because they're now bored with that. But because now they can have a full appreciation of this. There is no evolution. Probably if you're going to use a word close to that, it's devolution because you devolve down to the third dimension to experience. It's like a yo-yo, down and then back up again. And then on the way back up, you absorb all the experience and you plug it into the computer. So it all gets fed back up in again. Um, from, a, from the consciousness perspective, look, we, we don't evolve. Everything, evolution implies linear time. Okay? And there is no linear time. Everything is simultaneous. And if everything is simultaneous, there can be no evolution. Did, does that make sense? Okay. Everything just is. This moment is only connected to the moment that just passed because you choose to perceive it is. If I shoot a film, 24 frames a second, okay, this frame is only connected to the one that follows it because they've been put in a line. If I chop them all up individually and put them in the can, every single frame is there, independent. They're not connected at all. It's only if you choose to connect them that you can get a film. But let's say I randomly put all of those images back together and I play them through the film. Every single image is still there, but now they're random. And now it doesn't seem to make any sense. Doesn't seem to make any sense unless you have a higher perspective 
that can see that all of those frames are independent. The current public perception is of a date, December 21st, 2012, of the people who are aware of that date. So when you say 2012 to people, most people say, oh, that's supposed to be the end of the world. That's sort of the general layman person. Um, the people who are slightly more informed will talk about uh, revelations, the end of the world. They'll know the date, December 21st, 2012. And then you get into the spiritual people who talk about it being, a, it's a point of ascension. So they all have a perspective based on a date. The date itself is a fallacy, doesn't exist. And it comes from a paganism aspect, which is about the winter solstice date. And it actually has no relevance whatsoever. It's been plucked out of the air. It, it's not in the Mayan calendar. It's called desensitization is the more that you play these images to people, the more people get desensitized to it. So whenever earth changes start to happen and you tell them it's just some other reason, they're desensitized to the real reason, so therefore they don't notice it. The truth is that there is a brown dwarf that has an orbit around our sun. It's been part of the binary system of our sun since its very formation. It has a number of planets around it. And it's coming through in a very close path with our Earth. And that close path is in September this year, two months away from, from where we are now. And it will cause massive Earth changes. It will break down our protective shield, we will be bombarded with cosmo cosmic radiation, uh, earthquakes on a scale that you can't even comprehend, uh, wildfires, the surface temperature of the planet will go up to 60 degrees, probably even more. Uh, all the volcanoes will erupt, ones that have been dormant for however many years. Um, tidal surges, tidal waves, the moon will get pulled out of its orbit, the earth will get pulled out of its orbit. Um, we will go through an asteroid tail that's being pulled in behind it. We're talking about massive global geographic changes that happen on a regular basis on this planet. It's not a, that is the physical thing that's going to happen and it is happening in the next couple of months. The date 2012 has been an artificial uh, thing that's been placed in there. Uh, it's not, not Mayan. Uh, people have tried to match the Mayan calendar to our calendar by backtracking and try to line things up. And, but the Mayans talk about astronomical events, which helps to line things up. And that's why we know that there's going to be something happening towards the end of next year, because the Mayans talk about a double eclipse. They talk about a, the passage of Venus in front of the sun, in front of um, Orion, I think it is. So we, we can look at it and we can trace it to those events to know the Mayans are talking about something that happens when those things are in place. And that is the end of next year. So that's an astronomical event. It's not the 21st of the 12th. It's actually a, a period of transition period that the Mayans talk about, which is from around mid-December through to the beginning of February. And that's exactly the time it takes us to go through this photon band. So that's what the Mayans are talking about. Everybody else has dumped everything on top of it. All of the end of world scenario has been dumped into that date. And the date was created by the Illuminati for a reason. Because they don't want the spiritually aware people to hang around afterwards. They don't want free thinking people. They want people they can manipulate. So therefore, what better way than to create a false date after the event so that all of the spiritual people who are preparing for the end of 2012 will be caught totally unprepared by September 2011 and therefore will all perish. You eliminate your greatest threat by giving them what they want, which is a date where they can focus all of their spiritual attention on. We know that there's a, a brown dwarf star, which is a companion star to our sun. 
NASA has even announced it and then tried to suppress it all and do all of this. Um, and they've tried to make it sound like it's billions and billions of miles away and it's way out in the distance. And, but we know that that's what's caused all the Earth changes in the past and we know that that's the real cause of global warming because a brown dwarf throws off huge amounts of infrared heat. And if we look at the other the data, the other facts that are out there, we've seen that every planet in our solar system is heating up at the moment. There have been big changes going on chronologically or through, through Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, Jupiter. There are changes that have been happening which showing whatever this thing is happening is coming in as we speak and has been coming in over the last couple of years through the inner solar system. Um, we're seeing an increase in the levels of uh, volcanic activity and earthquakes on a massive scale, 140, 200% increase in the magnitude um, and uh, frequency of earthquakes just in the first four or five months of this year. There's been an increase compared to last year and previous years. So there's this spike happening. Something's causing that. And when we start to say, well, okay, What's causing that? There have been alignments between a body that NASA is referring to as Elenin, which they're calling a comet, and yet they have all their infrared telescopes focused on this comet. Comets are supposedly just a bundle of dirt and ice. So why they're focusing infrared satellites on it, I don't know. If it was a comet. If it wasn't a comet and it was a brown dwarf, that would make sense. It also would make sense because every time this object is in direct alignment between our sun and the earth, there's a major earthquake. And gravitational waves, when they line up, cause amplifications, which would cause earthquakes on the planet and volcanoes. And every single time this is in alignment with our earth and either the sun or some other body, there are earthquakes going on. You can predict them based on the alignments. And I've gone down in record to say, look, and I have to double check on the August the 6th one, but I think there's going to be one next Saturday. There'll definitely be one August 17th. And I've got a fair idea where it will be in the northwest part of America. But when those things happen, and you only have to look at the proof, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to make that prediction. It doesn't mean I'm some massive psychic. I'm not making a prediction on that that there's going to be an earthquake based on channeling. That's based on science. The location of where it is is being based on channeling because I got told it last year before I'd even found this scientific information. So we've, we're in a position to say, look, here's the scientific evidence to support all of this. And it's NASA. And NASA, of course, like the Illuminati, they hide everything in the most obvious spot because it's their way of saying to you how stupid you are because I've put it right under your nose and you didn't even notice it. Because then they say, oh, we're not hiding anything. You know, what are you talking about? You know, it's a comet. Every time there's been a comet previously, NASA's been jumping up and down months in advance saying it's going to look spectacular across the sky. You know, everyone should get a telescope and look at it. This is coming within 21 million miles of the Earth, so close. And NASA said nothing about it, absolutely nothing. If you get up pre-dawn, it has to be before dawn because once it's in the infrared spectrum, so you can't see it in daylight because it doesn't throw off light. But just before dawn, because of the angle of the rays hitting the, the uh, this atmosphere, they get diffracted. And when light gets diffracted, it can split up, split up into frequencies. So at that time, you can actually see it. And there's some wonderful images um, on YouTube of people who've, who've taken pictures of it and footage of it. Um, but there will become a time when it will become very visible in the air because it's massive. It's one third the size of the sun. I'm thinking that's probably going to be maybe a week or two beforehand. So what's that about the 14th or something, 15th of September? It's going to be really noticeable, maybe even earlier than that, because it's just going to be this big black mass. And understand, it's got four or five Jupiter-sized planets around it as well. So you're going to see those in the sky. Once people start to ask too many questions and they've fobbed it off by saying, so they've introduced a lot of red herrings, um, a planet called Tyche, which they say is potentially out there, which they've said is 
you know, outside the solar system and then suddenly it will appear. So for a while they'll try and bullshit us by saying, oh, it's this other planet, Tyche. And then people go, oh, okay, well, well, what's the implications? Because now we're noticing more tidal stuff happening in earthquakes. So what they do is, is once it gets to that point where they go, all right, they're asking too many questions, it's getting to this financial collapse. Totally collapse the financial markets of the world because now people are going to be more worried about the fact they haven't got money and food than about that thing in the sky. So they divert by creating a bigger problem. And they're setting it up. They've been setting it up with the Greek economy. They've been setting it up with the American economy. They've been setting it up with Italian and Spanish economies. And they're all, they're all being delayed and propped up at the moment by little stopgap measures because we can't see it yet. But the minute we become too aware of it, they'll collapse the total world financial economy and you won't have access to money. Money won't exist anymore. Only what you've got in your hand. You could have $100,000 in the bank, gone, because the bank's gone. And your money doesn't exist. Electronic money is, a, is an illusion. The only money that exists is the cash you have in your hand. So anybody who's wise will take all their money out of the bank and either stuff it under their mattress or put it in a safe deposit box. Because if it's in a safe deposit box, you can still get it because it's your property because they don't know what's in there. Those people who don't, give it two or three days. When people realise that they can't get money, they won't go to jobs. So now they're going to have to feed their families. The supermarkets will all be empty and total anarchy will rule. And that's when they bring in the military and they start shipping people off to detention centres where they're going to feed them and look after them and do all of that sort of stuff. Look, the Illuminati are preparing massive underground bunkers where they can house millions of people as their servants to do things and their own family. A lot of those underground bunkers are actually going to be compromised, filled full of water, um, earth, what, they won't be able to get, they're actually building tombs for themselves, but their arrogance makes them think that they're going to be able to survive it. The reality is that they think that even the highest parts of them, the highest ones in the Illuminati, are going to be taken off planet by their reptilian keepers. They're not going to, the reptilians lie to them all the time, so they've given them false promises. Those that do survive, some are going to have a shift, but those that do survive, their fears will keep them at third dimension. The rest of us will be operating at fifth dimensional level because we'll have gone through and prepared for this ascension, for this energy surge that will go on. So there will be a heaven on earth and a hell on earth that is talked about. The hell on earth will be at the third dimensional level and the fifth dimensional level will be the heaven on earth. Exactly the same space, but just different dimensional vibrational stuff. We won't be affected by all of the crap that's going on. Ego has an important function in our third dimensional existence and it's to process the moment. Without an ego, we, can't, we don't know that red is red. We don't know that hot is cold. We don't know what emotions we're feeling. We need an ego to be able to process those experiences. But there are, the ego is only meant to process the present. It's not to then start going into the past and taking events that are not related you know, that frame, that frame is not related to any of other frames. So the ego is not supposed to go back and say, oh, look, this happened before, therefore I'm going to project it forward that that will happen again. Because the minute the ego starts getting out of the present moment and starts to get into linearity, it starts to get caught up in fear. So what we have to say to our ego is that we have this really important role. You have an amazing role. You have to be so focused in the present that I can become totally aware of everything that's going on around me. And when you do that, I can make the most amazing films. And the ego goes, really? Really? And now it feels empowered because it knows what its job is and it knows if it deviates from that, it affects the function. It stops me from operating at my maximum. So all of these people that talk about suppressing their ego and eliminating their ego, the ego just fights. It says, no, no, I've got a job to do. I've got a job to do. And it won't go away. So now they're in battle with their own ego. You know, your higher self creates this ego as your processor so that you can comprehend the experiences you're having. 
it's, it's like the filter and the absorber all at once. It, it's sort of there, it's really important. But if you allow it to do more beyond that, now it's, it's going to start pulling you into fear-based linearities. Whereas if you can stay totally in the moment, allowing your ego to fulfill its punk, uh, function of absorbing everything, every sound, every light experience, then you can stay at your fifth level of awareness or more all the time because you're not being run by fear. And then the Drakos agenda just doesn't run through you. Well, the, the greatest thing to do is acknowledge that your higher self has actually chosen to be a part of this, to experience this, to experience the fear and then to get through the fear. You know, you can't confront a fear by pushing it under the carpet and hoping it'll go away. You know, your fears are like a pack of hungry wolves. Eventually, they're going to hunt you down and rip you to shreds. But if you stand up and you start running at that pack of wolves, they bolt because they're so scared that you're running at them. It's like a lion. If you run away from a lion, it's going to instinctively chase you. But if you run towards a lion, it backs off because it feels threatened. And that's what your fears are like. They're there for you to experience this. So by all means, go through, be terrified, horrified. It couldn't possibly be true. Denial, denial, fear, fear, fear. And then get through it and start to see the exciting aspect of it. Don't be attached to all the materialist things that are going on. Let go of them. Sell your house. Sell your property. You, you've, you've got a month to do it. If you can, do it. And don't try to get market value for it. Don't be greedy. Sell it for a bargain and you'll get a one-week settlement. And then you can use that money to prepare if you want to prepare to be a part of the future. Because there are some people who will be a part of the future. A lot of people said, well, what's the point? If we're all going to die, what's the point? Well, the point is we're not all going to die. The point is some of us are going to survive with an awakened level of consciousness and be the beginnings of an extraordinary time on this planet. Well, I want to be part of that. That sounds amazing. The most important preparation for people to make is in their heart, which means they have to get out of their head because your head will just propagate fears. So you have to get out of your head and get into your heart and allow your heart to be the ruler and say to the head, what do I need to do to prepare? It's not the head saying, what do I need to do and the heart having to adjust. You go into your heart, a state of being, a state of love, and you say, right, I know what I'm here to do. I know what I'm meant to be, da, 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 da. What do I need to do physically to prepare for that? And it will tell you to find somewhere safe, um, to plan ahead, to find, you might find a support group, a survival group, etc., who are all like-minded. So the most important thing is to let go of all attachments, because all attachments are based in fear. Oh, I'm fearful I'm going to lose my car. I'm fearful I'm going to lose my job. I'm fearful I'm going to lose my, my partner. So we're attached emotionally to these things and we have to just let it all go and just be in our heart, be in a state of love and then follow our own guidance. And it will, some people will be told that they need to prepare, but not to prepare out of fear of what's going to happen, but to prepare for what happens after these events. There are the higher dimensional aspects and beings who are going to be there to guide us through. That's if you are of human consciousness. See, the star races who are here will just go back to their dimensional consciousness. That's why so many of the light workers think nothing's going to happen, it's just going to be a smooth transition. Well, it will be for them. They'll just leave their body. But the human consciousnesses won't. And that's why I say to people, you know, just go in, just make a decision. Have you come here from a star system? Have you all your life been connected to some sort of star race, whatever it may be, and always felt that you came from the stars and you're here for a reason and you've been doing the sort of work to help people? Or do you feel that you are, that's something that you're aspiring to do, that you're wanting to leave the earth, that you feel like you've achieved everything you need to do here and you're ready to embark on a journey beyond that? Because you'll be one or the other. 
No one is better than the other. This is the great thing. In the eyes of Source, no one is better than anyone else. Everyone plays their part in a film. You're a filmmaker. You know the person who holds the, holds the sound is just as important as the person who runs the camera. It's just as important as the director. It's just as important as the extra in the background drinking a cup of coffee. We all have different responsibilities, but we are all integral into the success of that film. And if one of us doesn't play our part right, the film is incomplete or doesn't function properly. And that's how Source sees everything. No ego. It's extraordinary. There's free energy. Everything, all the energy is based on magnetics um, and it's all free. Um, there's amazing creativity. There's a credible sense of community and love. There's no partnerships anymore. People are just part of the community. There's love. Children are looked after by everyone. Uh, it's an extraordinary time. It's, the, it's everything that humanity aspires to be. And we're going to be helped rebuilding. You know, these fifth dimensional beings are going to help us rebuild. And we're also going to be able to manifest whatever we want. They're going to teach us and educate us how to fully use our powers of manifestation. It's an extraordinary time for the human consciousness. I'm not part of the human consciousness. I just happen to be in a human body. And there are other people like that as well. And we're here to help that human consciousness get through this. Why would you not want to be part of that? Why would you allow your fear to say, oh, well, I hope I'm one of the first who dies when it happens. And that's okay. If that's what your journey is, then that's what you can do. But what about your children? Why are you making a decision for them? Well, maybe they made the decision to come in to, to not have the decision. But everybody's fear will be pulled to the surface because that's the only way you can deal with it. Everybody's fear will be pulled to the surface so they can deal with it. 99.9% .9 of the population will stick their head in the sand and hope the whole thing will go away. But we know what happens when you get your head stuck in the sand, your ass is stuck in the air and someone's going to come along and go... <laughs> But we had to have, we had to have that separation first for us to truly appreciate what that's going to be like. If we go into it and we don't know anything different, we don't have gratitude and appreciation for it. So we had to have had all of these shit times with all the separation and all the greed and the self-service and all that sort of stuff for us to truly appreciate what we're going to rebuild. This has been an important part of the process in the film. Where are we in the film? We're coming up to the final turning point. Where everything starts to go absolutely haywire. The final turning point. This is the, the, height, the height point of the drama we're coming up to. And as a filmmaker, that's, you, know, you, you structure everything around that. You've got to write a really brilliant opening to a film. And your best writing is at the end because you have to tie everything in together. But your most creative aspect is that turning point. And that's where the height, the most drama is, is that turning point. And that's where we are now. Okay.